Welcome to the latest installment of the AST AJT Journal Club series. Today's Journal Club features the article, The Respiratory Microbiome After Lung Transplantation, Reflection or Driver of Respiratory Disease, and is hosted by the AST Infectious Disease Community of Practice and the AST Thoracic and Critical Care Communities of Practice. Our moderator today will be Dr. Leopoldo Segal from New York University School of Medicine. However, before we turn the session over to our moderator, we do have a few housekeeping notes to help you engage with today's session. On the screen now, you will see a viewership polling question displayed for the audience. Please take a moment to answer this question while we refinish the remaining announcements. This journal club is being recorded and the archive will be available on the MyAST website in two to three business days after the live session. Please note that your lines have all been muted so that only the presenters can be heard clearly for the archive recording. If you have a question for our panelists during the Journal Club, we encourage you to participate by using the Q&A button in the Zoom webinar panel. Questions submitted via chat may be missed during the presentation. If there are questions we do not have time for, we will answer them individually offline, or we will post the full question and answer on the website following the Journal Club. Finally, when you log off at the conclusion of today's session, you will see a link to a short evaluation survey to complete. Please fill out the survey to help us keep our content current and engaging. I will now turn the session over to our moderator, Dr. Segal, to begin our presentation. Hi, how are you, everybody? I'm Leo Segal from NYU. I specialize on lung microbiome and host immune response. Uh, and this is a topic that is uh, quite interesting that uh, Caroline Eskind, who is uh, an assistant professor of the Division of Infectious Disease and Vanderbilt, wrote in a mini review in HAT. Uh, so we'll be looking forward to your presentation, Caroline. Please go ahead. All right, thank you guys so much. Thank you to the AST for inviting us. We're very excited. Um, uh, I'm on here. I'm uh, an assistant professor at Vanderbilt University uh, Medical Center in Nashville, Tennessee. Also on is um, my mentor, Dr. Gauri Satan Uriah, uh, who uh, is also at Vanderbilt. And we're in the in Division of Infectious Diseases. So thank you guys for having us. Um, I'll go ahead and turn off my video, but hopefully y'all can see my slides. Um, so yes, this is the um, this is the title of our uh, journal that our article that was published. Um, in July of this year in the uh, American Journal of Transplantation. We have no uh, conflict of interest to disclose. So uh, just to start off right away, um, you know, we're going to be talking about really detailed minutia of the lung microbiome, but we have to really consider why is why do we care about this type of things? And remember that this, this really does all revolve around our patients. I imagine that the majority of the folks in the audience are probably uh, pulmonologists. And so this shouldn't be a surprise to you that, um, you know, compared to uh, the outcomes of other solid organ recipients, lung transplants um, have relatively poor outcomes still, unfortunately. Uh, we have made significant advances, as you can see um, on the top graphic, uh, over decades, we have seen improvements in survival, especially in the first year, um, such that one year mortality is is at about uh, one more one year survival is at about 85 percent. However, unfortunately, five year survival is still just under 60 percent. And so there's still a fair amount of room for improvement. Um, within the first year post-transplant, uh, significant morbidity and mortality is driven by infections. And after that first year, um, far and away, uh, survival is limited by CLAD, which stands for chronic lung allograft uh, dysfunction. And the most prominent or the most predominant form of CLAD is BOS or bronchiolitis obliterans syndrome. And you can see on this um, lower graphic that although a little outdated, um, just as time goes on, that about half of all patients do end up with BOS by five years. Um, and then once they do have this diagnosis, treatments are very limited and survival is usually measured in just um, a few years remaining. So there's obviously a lot, a uh, big area of improvement uh, and a lot of interest in research because there's a good need. So why look to the microbiome? Well, first off, um, we are infectious disease doctors. Gowrie and I were not pulmonologists. Um, however, 
um, why, why would we even consider looking towards the microbiome? So um, while the pathophysiology of CLAD and BOS is not entirely known for sure, essentially what we believe is that um, excessive injury and inflammation uh, that occurs in the airway small vessels lead to irregular tissue repair and then excessive fib fibrosis that damages the small airways and prevents um, airway exchange um, and eventually graft failure. So a variety of things have been implicated or associated with the development of CLAD and BOS, including episodes of acute cellular rejection, reflux disease, primary graft dysfunction, lymphocytic bronchiolitis, et cetera. Um, but beyond these um, specific organisms have actually been implicated as well, both in terms of just merely colonization as well as acute infection seem to be relevant. So specifically, um, this graphic on the right is uh, describing lung transplant recipients who are colonized with Pseudomonas, the top one um, being all lung transplant recipients uh, who are colonized, the solid lung um, representing those who are not colonized with Pseudomonas, the dashed line being those who are colonized with Pseudomonas, showing that um, colonization with Pseudomonas does seem to have uh, does seem to have a greater association with development of BOS. The second two um, graphics just break apart these total lung transplant patients to those that are transplanted for cystic fibrosis and, and those transplanted for other etiologies. Um, and so uh, in addition to pseudomonas, colonization with aspergillus has been associated with BOS, as well as um, acute lower respiratory tract infection with community acquired viruses. So because we know that infection with certain organisms causes significant morbidity and mortality in the first year, and that colonization and infections with various organisms seems to have something to do with BOS, which we don't fully understand how or why it happens, it seems relevant to an infectious disease that doctor, well, let's figure out what's in this microbiome and how could it possibly be contributing and what can we do about it? So before I go any further, for those of you that are wondering, when am I gonna tell you what is a microbiome? Um, your wait is over. So uh, I thought I would define it, although you, you think it would be pretty um, agreed upon, but it can vary uh, person to person and paper to paper. Um, but for my purposes, I, I believe microbiome represents basically all living organisms in a particular environment. That includes bacteria, viruses, fungi, protozoa, and basically all of their genes and gene products um, in a specific environment, whether um, whether that's a, you know a specific section of the body, just a, one isolated habitat. And so, how does this microbiome sequencing work? Well, up until you know past recent decades, we relied entirely on culture-based um, culture based data. And, you know, for cultures, you have to um, have a viable organism. You have to have a media um, that in which it can grow. It can't be a fastidious organism. You also have to know what you're looking for. You can't really identify something that you don't that you don't know of already. So there are definitely limitations to culture data that um, sequencing can overcome. So this is kind of a, a simplified graphic to just um, give you a, a quick understanding of what we're talking about when we say sequencing. So you start with a, a community sample, say fluid from a BAL. And the most um, frequently used method and probably ones that you'll have at all your hospital would be the 16S based approach. And so um, 16S is a, a ribosomal RNA subunit gene that's fairly ubiquitous and, and conserved between all bacteria, meaning that almost all bacteria have this gene. Um, and you can, um, in searching for it, you can identify bacteria. Within this conserved gene, though, there are multiple hypervariable regions such that you can tell different bacteria apart from one another. So basically, you take your sample, you extract all the DNA, and try to isolate the 16S um, gene and amplify all of those sequences. Um, then looking at the hypervariable regions and how different they are from one another, you can group together ones that are extremely similar, at least 97% similar into separate groups. And we call these OTUs, that stands for Operational Taxonomic Unit, basically just a surrogate name for this is a unique bacteria. Once you have these OTUs, you can um, use one of multiple databases that are out there to 
determine, okay, what do these random letters, what organism does that actually mean? And how is that significant to me? You can also either before or after determining what the bacteria actually is, you can do all sorts of um, data analysis. You can determine the relative abundance. So is there a ton of this red OTU3 and very little of OTU2 and 4, or um, are they evenly distributed? You can also measure out uh, phylogenic relatedness, do all sorts of other computational analyses. Um, alternatively, um, Aside from searching specifically for the 16S uh, gene in, D in the bacterial DNA, um, you can go the alternative with a whole genome sequencing or shotgun metagenomic approach, where basically you just uh, sequence all of the DNA present. And that relies very heavily on these databases to determine, well, are these bacteria, viruses, are these is this host cell DNA? And from there, you can... Um, conduct similar uh, analyses and test to describe the, um, the community. What we can and cannot tell, so there are some disadvantages, you know, we, by sequencing this DNA, we cannot determine our, um, are the bacteria that we identify, are they dead or alive? While in a culture, obviously, if it grows, it's alive. So we can't guarantee that a, a sequenced DNA that's present is not dead. Um, an advantage, though, compared to cultures where you may just grow one or maybe two bacteria that happen to grow really well in culture, this will give you a snapshot in time of basically all the bacteria that are present, even if they can't grow in culture or they don't grow in culture when, when Pseudomonas is present and just overgrows everything else there. You can also get with this relative abundance. Um, it's not uh, actually... A, it's not an exact quantification. This is relevant, a relative. So you kind of get a breakdown of what, what adds up to the 100%. But you can find out what exists in large abundance and what is there a lot less of. And you can also tell what is the community structure? Is it very even? Is there a ton of one thing and not a lot of another? The downside, though, is even though there is a lot of, say, this red OTU, is it necessarily the most transcriptionally active? Is it the most significant in the community? And how much is it doing? Or is this smaller yellow OTU actually doing a lot of the heavy lifting? We can overcome these difficulties with um, even more advanced sequencing. If you've heard of metatranscriptomics, metabolomics, all sorts of omics that basically um, sequence RNA and other DNA that will help us decide, help us reveal what enzymes are active and what pathways are active. And that can give you a better idea of, of the bacteria present, who's doing what and what are they doing. So adding all these layers together, you can learn really a lot about a microbiome that um, a culture just can't do for you. So one last clarification step, just to make sure that we're all on the same page. Um, so we, I'm, you may hear me discuss a couple words, and I will hope that you know what I mean about them. Basically, um, with a microbiome, you can describe the richness of, of the community. And richness is, it more or less basically just means how many different organisms are there or how many OTUs. And so you can see, just based on my rudimentary shape making, um, that uh, there are more different OTUs in this, this section. And so um, you would say this community has greater richness than this community or a higher richness score. Evenness, um, similarly, you know, kind of as you would expect by the name is how, um, how balanced are these communities in terms of each OTU? Is there the same amount of each OTU, good representation from each group? or is there a lot of a few and very little of others? So I would say that this community over here has um, higher evenness score compared to this, which um, the OTUs are not as evenly balanced. There's a lot more of this yellow, only one of this purple. Um, alpha diversity uh, is something that's very important and frequently uh, referenced in um, studies of the lung microbiome as well as gut microbiome, but basically, um, it is a actually a calculated number. There's a couple different indices and calculations that you can use. Um, I think the most popular would be the Shannon Diversity Index. But basically, it's a calculation that takes into account both richness and evenness. So you, you would be able to describe the diversity of one community 
uh, as being high if there's a lot of different organisms and if there is a good uh, significant abundance of all of these organisms, then you would have high alpha diversity. If you had few organisms, so just say you had, you know, two or three different OTUs present and um, there was a lot of one and very little of the other two, then you would have low alpha diversity. Beta diversity, on the other hand, it's, a, it's also a calculation um, and that is used to describe the similarity or dissimilarity between two communities. And that's based on what organisms are present, if there's any overlap, um, as well as the community structure, if they are similar or dissimilar in community structure. So moving forward, I will talk about diversity a lot. I will be primarily referencing alpha diversity and I'll try to be specific and clarify that. Um, but when in doubt, I will be talking about alpha diversity. So without further ado, let's get into the lungs, what we all wanted to hear about now that hopefully we all get what I'm talking about. So um, while we you know, previously thought that lungs were essentially sterile, except in setting of infection, with the advent of these more advanced sequencing techniques, it's become quite clear that even healthy lungs do have a fairly you know, typical and, and generalizable uh, lung microbiome. And I think not unexpectedly that the organisms that are present in the lower respiratory tract of healthy people are, are similar organisms that one would expect in a healthy or a pharynx. And we think that that's probably the case because most of these organisms enter the lungs through direct inhalation or um, subclinical microaspiration. And then if they have the ability to uh, proliferate and do well in that environment, then they will. And so uh, when I say that these organisms generally are the same as reflected in typical oropharynx, so what I'm referring to is um, there's usually a significant abundance of streptococcus, prevotella, veinella, um, sometimes rothia, less common members, but ones that are often still present, at least in smaller quantities in healthy lungs include pseudomonas, haemophilus, fusobacteria, gamella, and porphyromonas. Overall, there is, a, in the respi lower respiratory tract, there is generally a low bacterial biomass that's compared to both the mouth and then exponentially less so than the gut microbiome, as you might imagine. Um, so it, it can be difficult to do these studies. Um, so those are the healthy lungs, but what about folks that are, aren't transplant patients but still suffer from some respiratory disease, whether it's asthma, COPD, IPF, CF, in general, as folks with chronic lung diseases progress in their disease or those that have more severe lung disease tend to have lower diversity, and I say lower alpha diversity. And so this graph here shows that as FEV1 reduced in folks with COPD, so as they developed worse and more severe COPD, their diversity, the Shannon index and the Chow index, uh, were lower. Uh, and this was similarly reflected in folks with CF and IPF that as their disease advanced, they had lower alpha diversity. And what we don't know is, is this because those dominant organisms become, are pathogenic and lead to damage causing worse disease severity? Or does the, does the, does the progression of the disease lead to an environment um, such that changes in pH, mucus volume, thickness, clearance, just make it more hospitable for fewer and fewer bacteria. So in this way, we don't know, is, it, is this causing the worst disease or is this a reflection and a consequence of the worst disease? Now that we know a little bit more about what's in the healthy lungs, we can talk about what's in the lung transplant uh, lung microbiome. And while there is um, a good amount of overlap, uh, I think that in general, what we've discovered from the descriptional studies out there is that it is unique and it's unique compared to healthy lungs, but it's also unique compared to pre-transplant, not healthy lungs. Um, so what you can see um, in this uh, top left graph is basically um, principal coordinate analyses uh, where the blue represents control, so those are healthy non-transplant lungs. The uh, green dots represent tra lung transplant recipients who are undergoing bronchoscopies for at asymptomatic periods, just surveillance 
And then the yellow are lung transplant recipients who are undergoing bronchoscopies at the time of active respiratory symptoms. And caveat meaning um, we don't know if these symptoms in are indicating an infection, an episode of rejection, boss, what have you, but they have symptoms. And so you can see that there is a good amount of overlap. Lung transplant recipients still do usually carry some of the typical uh, organisms we talked about that are in healthy patients like Prevotella, Streptococcus, Veonella, but they're not always consistently found and they're not usually as abundantly found or as well balanced as they would be in a healthy patient. Instead of having kind of a healthy, um, even distribution of these organisms, they usually have a greater significant abundance of gram-negative proteobacteria, things like E. coli and Pseudomonas. Um, so even though you can see that there is some overlap, when you organize or when you plot the centroid, um, you're able to see that there is a significant difference between these groups and that you can distinguish them from one another in terms of the, um, the bacterial inhabitants. And then interestingly on this uh, lower right hand corner, you can see um, they actually describe what these OTUs represent in a database, you can see what organism is driving their distinct separation on the principal coordinate analysis um, axes. So for those who are the healthy controls, it's driven primarily by Prevotella, which we said is, you know, that's expected to be in healthy lungs. And while it may be in transplanted lungs, the, the abundance of it and the, um, the abundance of it in healthy controls and the lower abundance in transplant patients does seem to be driving its difference. For the um, symptomatic transplant patients, those with active respiratory symptoms, uh, that, that um, statistical difference is driven by E. coli and Pseudomonas, and here this is Pseudomonas aeruginosa. These asymptomatic uh, lung transplant patients they were driven to be distinct by a different Pseudomonas, Pseudomonas fluorescens, which um, carries a different connotation, uh, uh, less associated with acute infection. Um, this, so this distinction between a lung transplant patient and a healthy uh, patient in terms of their lung microbiome uh, is even more pronounced uh, in the setting of a possible infection, or at least with symptoms. And despite differences in healthy patients or even pre-transplant patients and post-transplant patients, the distinction is usually less impressive in cystic fibrosis patients. And I think that's not surprising in those who take care of them and that we know usually you know, pre and post-transplant, pre-transplant, they're heavily dominated by pathogenic bacteria, especially Pseudomonas or Staph aureus. And, and very frequently they are recolonized with the same organism. So um, there's usually less variability pre and post transplant with CF patients than there are between patients transplanted for other underlying lung diseases. In addition to specifically what organisms are present and, and how the different organisms that are present and the different abundances that are present, in general, the community structure is also different. Almost consistently, the uh, alpha diversity of transplant patients kind of grouped collectively on average is lower than non-transplant controls. And, and you can see that in both of these papers that healthy patients and transplant patients have um, different diversity with transplant patients having lower. This significance or this reduction in diversity is even more impressive when you um, separate the transplant patients into those that are symptomatic and asymptomatic with symptomatic patients having um, slightly lower, sometimes significantly, sometimes not uh, lower diversity, even further than the asymptomatic transplant patients. And this was also uh, found to be even more striking in those that were transplanted for suppurative lung diseases like CF. Again, also not surprising just based on their pre and post transplant um, sometimes consistent colonization is that they tend to have even lower diversity than the non-suppurative transplant patients. But overall, in general, uh, lower alpha diversity than controls. And by controls, we mean healthy uh, non-lung transplant patients. What we're not sure though is um, if this loss of diversity is 
kind of a consequence of uh, the transplant itself or if it's related to immune suppression, antibiotics, but it is seen consistently um, kind of in, a, in mixed populations. All of the studies do tend to try to include a variety of patients transplanted for different diseases, sometimes single, sometimes double, always accounting for antibiotic use and, and um, immunosuppressive use as well. So uh, we spoke, I spoke earlier about how uh, Pseudomonas, as well as other organisms, have been associated with the, with, have been associated with the development of BOS. And so it's kind of become um, pretty much dogma before this that Pseudomonas was bad and it would lead to BOS. Well, um, after the, after genetic sequencing became more popular, some more studies started to come out saying, well, maybe that's just not right. You know, we're showing that Pseudomonas, especially in some CF patients, does not predispose to BOS. And so Willer did a really great study where he took lung transplant patients and um, was able to show something that kind of really hadn't been shown before. So he demonstrated that lung transplant patients that were recolonized with the same bacteria that had dominated their microbiomes pre-transplant were at reduced risk of developing BOS. So for example, for a CF patient who might have had pseudomonas, you know, just heavily colonized by pseudomonas pre-transplant. If post-transplant, if they again, you know, were recolonized by pseudomonas, they actually uh, had a lower uh, likelihood of developing BOS. Those who were not colonized pre-transplant and developed de novo colonization with pseudomonas did have a predisposition for developing BOS. Um, those CF patients who did not become recolonized with pseudomonas, but instead were colonized with uh, different organisms, even those um, that we would normally think of as part of the healthy flora, were at increased risk of developing BOS. So it seems that it could not just be, you know, what is the organism that is present and what is the, uh, how abundant is this present organism? Is it excessively present? But does it really matter uh, what they were colonized with pre-transplant and what they're colonized with post-transplant, does recolonization matter even more than just the organism itself? So I think that that brings up kind of an interesting concept that was we were not aware of in the, in the culture-based area. Furthermore, um, looking at the microbiome in BOSS, since this is really kind of where we hope to, to gain the most insight and have you know, a significant positive effect, there have been some associations of things that might actually be protective uh, against developing BOS or have shown negative associations. So Schott et al. Um, he used metagenomic shotgun sequencing and he was able to distinctly cluster uh, his microbiome results of lung transplant recipients into three groups based on the dominant organism in that group. And so the three groups are AD, M, and PD. AD um, stands for act actinobacter dominant, and those are primarily gram-positive organisms. M stands for mixed, meaning kind of a, an even variety of gram-positive, gram-negatives. And then PD um, means proteobacteria dominant um, microbiomes, which most often gram-negative organisms and a lot of the pathogens we normally think about. And so what they discovered is that um, lung transplant patients who carried this AD phenotype were at a uh, were able to have longer BOS-free survival. And especially if they had this AD phenotype in the first three months post-transplant, they were uh, significantly less likely to develop uh, acute rejection, which we know is a risk factor for BOS. And this was independent of all other covariate features that they looked at. So what's so special about this AD group? Well, they do note that the AD group compared to, at least compared to the PD group, does have significantly higher uh, diversity. They also did note that it had um, greater richness. We also know that obviously it's enriched with different bacteria than the PD group, PD group being enriched in proteobacteria. The AD cluster was heavily enriched and fairly balanced in um, Streptococcus, Staphylococcus, Carinibacterium, Propionibacterium, and Sphingomonas, which although being a gram-negative, 
in their paper, they describe why it maybe shouldn't be uh, considered quite uh, as, as a typical gram negative. Uh, I won't go into the details about that, but basically this phenotype heavily dominated by multiple different gram positive organisms showed um, increased variety, increased richness, increased diversity. And this seems to have potentially a protective role um, in, in preventing BOSS. Uh, alternatively, it may not necessarily be preventative. It may just be a good prognostic indicator. We, we don't know just yet, um, but it does seem that perhaps the PD, the proteobacteria dominant group, um, could that be an indication or a precursor for development of BOSS or could it be contributing to BOSS? We just don't know just yet. Further investigation of not just describing um, what we find there and associations, but layering on um, these genet genetic sequencing tests with uh, the host immune response can tell us even more information because we know, or at least we feel pretty confident that the microbiome and the host immune system interact with each other kind of um, back and forth that there's dual interaction between each other. So uh, Bernasconi uh, published this paper in 2016, um, showing that when microbiomes were dominated by certain bacteria, that depending on which bacteria dominated, it was more associated with specific uh, cell activation profiles and cytokine responses. So you can see here, um, this line, the green, gray, and red, um, shows uh, these these or these communities were more likely to promote this remodeling phenotype. And remodeling uh, phenotype generally had significant expression of platelet-derived growth factor and tissue inhibitor of metalloproteinase matrix metalloproteinase. While these uh, red inflammatory profiles. Um, had higher expression of tumor necrosis factor and cyclooxygenase too. So they were able to separate their microbiomes into these activation profiles, as well as um, what bacteria was dominated by them. And when you kind of overlapped them and compared, you could see that there was an association with specific bacterial domination with the inflammatory profile. So what they discovered is that um, Sorry. The microbiome would, would induce specific immune responses so that um, firmicute, firmicutes and proteobacteria driven dysbiosis, they were more likely to be associated with the pro inflammatory activation profile, while um, the bacteroidetes dominated phenotypes were more often linked to the pro remodeling phenotype. So this, this may suggest that the microbiome or the bacteria themselves when dominant uh, can induce specific immune responses from the host. It may be the organism present. It may be that it's present in a significant abundance. It also uh, may have to do with whether or not an infection was present because they did find that um, more often infection or clinical infection was diagnosed in settings where firmicutes and proteobacteria were dominant. And, and those, if you recall, were associated with a pro-inflammatory response. So what we can tell is that there does seem to be kind of crosstalk between microbiota and host response. Uh, and perhaps does this indicate that the bacteria or the dominant bacteria is driving this? Uh, that we just don't know yet. Quickly, even though I, I wanted to primarily focus on the bacterial. Uh, I'll just say that we there, there are papers about the lung transplant virome, not to neglect viruses, but just a lot less is known. Just some interesting highlights that um, fat viruses in the lung microbiome are more ubiquitous than we thought. Um, community uh, acquired respiratory viruses are often present and present for quite longer than we expected, even if they're not um, causing symptoms or leading to episodes of rejection or boss, they're often still present and kind of just asymptomatic and unnoticed otherwise. 
One other interesting thing is this discovery of anelloviruses. So I um, didn't know much about this before I started looking into it, but anelloviruses, basically, they're not necessarily infectious, um, but we find that they're uh, heavily represented in the uh, BAL fluid of transplant patients. And interestingly, you can see on the top, they're also heavily represented in donor BAL. There's um, some consideration that the, the high level of anelloviruses could indicate the level of immune suppression, although obviously donor BAL, um, may, this may be more indicative of um, like inflammation associated with um, being on the vent or suffering brain death, but compared to a healthy BAL, um, there is significantly more. Um, there have been some associations made between the amount of anelloviruses both in the BAL as well as in serum. This uh, graph specifically relates to serum. So that measuring the amount of anelloviruses in someone's bronchoscopy or in someone's serum may be able to uh, predict earlier than um, you would with biopsies the development of acute cellular rejection or CLAD. Uh, also, we'll just talk even more briefly about fungi. Um, the, there's really a very little to be said. Basically, healthy lungs don't have a lot of fungus. Um, and then as patients develop, uh, patients have lung transplants, there are going to be quite greater quantities, but still um, not tons. As you can tell by this heat map, there's not a lot. Um, but what we do discover is that lung transplant recipients do have more fungi and the most um, commonly seen ones are ones that luckily we're familiar with, Candida, Aspergillus. Um, but like I said, not a lot of outcome data has been done so far. Um, this is also just comparing oropharyngeal washes to bronchiolar lavage fluid. Um, and just because a lot of people are, uh, are doing comparisons of nasopharyngeal or oropharyngeal washes. But uh, for my purposes, when I'm talking with the lung microbiome, I'm specifically um, targeting the lower respiratory tract, so predominantly with bronchial or lavage. So what are these clinical implications that we could possibly um, take from what we've learned so far about these just des mostly descriptive studies? Um, so, you know, going back to the title of the paper um, about is the respiratory microbiome, is it a reflection of what's going on or is it a driver of respiratory disease? Well, um, if it's a reflection, then perhaps we can use the microbiome as a diagnostic tool. We might be able to diagnose infection with greater sensitivity than we could with cultures. Um, we may also be able to detect or predict the outcomes of rejection and CLAD either earlier than we normally could or with greater ease um, without having to perform a lung biopsy by just doing one big sequencing and comparing it to, you know, their BAL fluid or the general BAL fluid of a lung transplant patient, we can make all sorts of predictions. And then, uh, you know, ideally in the future, I think after a lot more research has been done, the goal would be to use the microbiome as a therapeutic intervention. Um, this has really not been borne out just yet in the lung microbiome. I think it's, it's much more an active area in the gut microbiome, but I think that it should certainly be on the table as a, as a possible consideration. So um, given these possibilities in the future directions, I do think that, you know, reading through all these studies and even trying to do some of them ourselves, it's quite apparent that we do need standardization of practices in this field. Um, unlike gut microbiome, I can't speak to that, but I feel like they've got it a little bit, a little bit better down packed. The lung just has such a low biomass and is so at risk for uh, contamination at various steps. Um, that we really need to standardize our practices in terms of what hypervariable region are we sequencing, what sequencing methods are we using, what databases are we using, so that we can actually compare and combine information with reliability rather than having each you know, paper in a vacuum. I think that because there is such variability in each lung transplant patient, sometimes it's easier to compare or you learn more about comparing one patient to themselves um, over time rather than comparing them to all lung transplant patients as a group, just because they're so complicated and there's so many different variables at play to control for. I do think that um, it's been difficult to get a lot of longitudinal studies just because numbers are low um, and, you know, different, different issues, but uh, longitudinal studies in general, I do think will 
will help give us more information as well, like I said about uh, interpatient variability, learning more about how one person may change over time. Because I do think that there is value in studying an individual's microbiome over time rather than comparing two people to one another. Interventional studies, obviously, you know, a lot of our associations have been made, but we don't know um, if this is causation or the results. So I think interventional studies will help determine that. And then um, further incorporation of transcriptomics. So there has been, uh, you know, I showed you some of the layering with um, cytokine studies and host response, um, but incorporating metatranscriptomics to see what genetic pathways are active, to learn more about not what, not just what's there, but what are the bacteria present there doing? And, and based on what they're doing, does that help give us an idea if they're actively contributing to BOS or not? Um, so uh, I think that there's a lot of potential in this field. Um, hopefully some of you guys are already um, well at work and maybe could teach us a little bit more about what's going on. So with that, um, these are our, my references. It's not in fully inclusive for what we used in our paper, but this is what we used for today's presentation and we'll be happy to answer some questions. That's great. Okay. So we're, I guess we're gonna open for some questions, Carolyn, um, and people have been putting some of those in the in the chat. So um, I'm gonna direct you through some of this um, from the chat, or maybe some of my own. Um, one of them, um, they were asking if there is a lab microbiome signature that is specific of the allograph, but not de detected on the native lab. And a related one, they compare, if, if you have a single lung transplantation, can you detect a microbial signature in the, in the, in, that is different between the native and the allograph? It's a difficult question to answer because unfortunately, just because of such small um, sample sizes, like the, I would say the average paper that we read that says, oh, we, you know, we got a good number of samples could be just like 20 patients and 46 BALs. So they do tend to combine single lung and um, double lung transplant, kind of just put them together. And then when they do do single lung studies, they tend not to, not to perform the BAL studies on the native lung. Um, and I'm not sure if they just don't want to know or they don't want to complicate things. But when we do be when I see BAL studies of the lung microbiome on single lung transplants, they only will sequence the, the allograph lung. And now in terms of are there any microbiome signatures specific to lung transplant allograph not detected in the, the native lung? If you mean kind of like a, a signature of like there's always always this bacteria and not this bacteria. I think it's too hard to say just because there's so much variability. It's easier to generalize healthy lungs because they're more consistent in what they have. Lung transplant patients are so variable. That's why I really think it, it could be beneficial to, to compare them all to themselves because we can make generalizations. You can see I made generalizations about lung transplant patients but they are all so unique and individual. It's easier to compare individuals to themselves than as a whole group. So I can't say that there's one signature that if you showed me a microbiome, I would say that's a transplant patient, not a lung, not an, um, like a native lung patient. I don't think I could say that with certainty. Yeah, I, I, I guess um, the point that I would remark is, you know, as you point out, there is a heterogeneous nature of this lung transplantation. And, and despite the fact that these, these patients are frequently undergoing invasive procedure, I'm still surprised with the quality and the amount of data that exists uh, on, on these patients, not having a large number of patients that they have conducted investigations, not sampling with a careful topographical approach that many groups have, not comparing native and an allograph as it was pointed out. I think the, the question is, is good because it does point out to a need to have more investigations uh, comparing this and the need for longitudinal sampling, which you alluded to. And also the need to, if we could combine 
data from different institutions, but it's really hard to do when everybody's using different methods. It, it, you can't really combine this data because it's just not performed the same way. Well, uh, I was going to, to react a little bit to that. I, I don't think that there is a good way to, we're, we're definitely not ready to standardize methodology. I've been involved in consensus among many long microbial groups. And um, each of, one thing that it needs, I think it needs to be said and translated for people that don't do this is that every single method, even though we think that they are universal, every single method is biased. So you are, by deciding, for example, to, to sequence V1 versus V4 of variable region, your sequence is going to be biased. And there are things that you're not going to be able to identify. The same thing with metatranscriptoma metagenome. We do a lot. And depending on how you do your library prep, you will see some things and others. So I don't, I don't think that we're anywhere near to be able to, to standardize. Um, and, and there's going to be trade off when you pick your method. So before anybody takes the step to deciding how to do, you better contact somebody that has been doing it and, and is experienced on it. Um, but the, your point is well taken. We're not, we cannot combine data sets uh, from different groups. The low biomass uh, of these samples is a major challenge. The background contamination is not universal. And there's a sequencing noise that is stochastic that you cannot control for. And if you don't know about it, if you don't know how to look at it, you're gonna be, your data is gonna be affected by it. And another question was related to hypogamma globulinemia. I think I thought that, that was a good one because there are patients post-transplant that develop hypogamma globulinemia and that certainly will exert uh, microbial pressure. Is there anything known about uh, any relationship of hypoglomulinemia with what's happening in, 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 in the microbiome of lung transplantation? I'm not aware of anybody have looked at that. I, I know people have looked at this in, in the setting of uh, COPD and in, this, in mouse models, where if you do induce or block the ability to secrete, for example, IgA, your microbiome is going to change. Yeah, and that has been related to chronic inflammation in a preclinical mouse model of COPD, but I'm not aware of any of that work done in, in transplant. Not that I'm familiar with. It doesn't mean it's not out there, but I don't recall reading any papers specifically about that. Yeah, that, that's, that, that would be interesting. Um, the, the, there were a couple of questions about alpha diversity, you know, um, and is it different in, in patients that have more chronic versus acute rejection? Um, do you see changes in the microbiome with uh, during immunologic events such as ACR or AMR? Yeah, I think that, you know, not super consistently or at least in small studies, but we do see a drop in alpha diversity um, both in the setting of acute cellular rejection and with progression towards BOS. Um, I think maybe not uniformly because it, there's so many other things being taken into account because you have to compare each person to themselves. You know, um, you know, is this lower diversity to what they were like before or is this just lower diversity in general compared to the average person? But it does seem like during anything that's causing significant respiratory symptoms or significant inflammation, whether it's infection or rejection or BOS, that diversity does tend to decrease. Okay, so in, you mentioned in your talk a couple of times the term dysbiosis, um, and I struggle with that term. If you can explain to me what you think lung dysbiosis is. Uh, if I, if I can explain it, that's just one question. person it was originally a word we tried to leave out of our review paper. And I, I wonder if you count it how many times it's actually in there. It can't be more than five. We really tried to avoid it because it, even though I love using that word because it means something to me, I think it's inappropriately used all the time. Dysbiosis just basically means, it only should mean that it's different from normal. Um, so it's different from what's expected. And the only thing that you can say is normal and expected is what you see in the healthy lungs. So basically transplanted lungs are dysbiotic. To me though, when I say 
dysbiosis, I really think that it should only represent when there is significant disproportion of one or few organisms over another. So some papers will give an actual number or an example of saying dysbiosis, meaning at least 70% or more of one organism leading the pact. And I really like when they do that because dysbiosis is not a clear or commonly agreed upon term. And if you're gonna give it a number, then that just makes it a lot more, a lot more easily understood that what you're saying as dysbiosis is just disproportionate communities. So that's how I like to use it. When I say dysbiosis, I mean that um, there's some significant outgrowth and, and loss of the other the commensals. But in general, when other people use it, dysbiosis can mean simply that it just isn't normal anymore. Um, and the follow-up question is, what is a normal lung microbiome? What is eubiosis? Abiosis? Yes, normal lung microbiome so i would say in a healthy person hopefully in my lungs i would say uh normal microbiome or non-dysbiotic would be um, significant equal representation of a lot of oropharyngeal organisms like streptococcus prevotella bayonella those being the most dominant and then with a little bit lower but still decent representation of some other organisms including some gram negatives maybe a little bit of um, pseudomonas or a little bit of homophilus, a little bit of anaerobes. But in general, you want to have a, a good amount of evenness. Uh, you don't want just like one being really high and one being really low. I think it, it does seem that it's beneficial to have um, good evenness and good variety and that both health, most healthy patients do have that. Let, let me tell you, maybe Corey can pitch in, but let me tell you why I struggle with the term, okay? I don't think that we all have oral commensals in the lower airways. I do think that we're frequently exposed to microaspiration. And if you, if you sample at that time, you'll find some oral commensals. But I do think that they are clear very rapidly. And that what we're seeing in most patients is uh, the traces of DNA from that episode of microaspiration that in part may be contributing to affecting your lower airway immune tone. It might even have a beneficial effect on the lower airway immune tone. We have, uh, we, we've recently published a mouse paper showing that that might be a possibility. So, so to me, I struggle with defining normal lung microbiome because I think, you know, in the other situations where you don't find oral commensals in the lower airways, you just don't find much evidence of actual uh, microbes and what most of what you find is bacterial DNA coming from back background contamination. So and do you think uh, your your thoughts are that what we're finding is more contamination or is it something that has been inhaled and then has since died think, and is no I longer think, relevant? I think any microbiome study has to accept that you are a large proportion of your data in the low biomass samples is gonna be background contamination. And you have to know your method and you have to be careful how to interpret the method. And that's what we've done. We've done studies in health individuals or some of the groups that have done bronchoscopies in health individuals, that's what we find. And, and others have some find similar. So you have to be very careful when you if, you, if you guys are thinking of doing investigations in this cohort of patients, you might also have to deal with a large proportion of your data that is gonna come from background contamination. Um, now, I do agree that diversity is in generally good, but the other comment that I would say is that not every infection with a pathogen leads to dominance of the microbiome by the pathogen. An example is non-tuberculous mycobacterium, and, but there are other examples. There are some respiratory pathogens that when you look at the lower one microbiome, they are almost never dominant. Whereas if you look at the morphulus, or if you look at a, a patient that develops the pseudomona or, or patients with cystic fibrosis, yes, those, I agree with you, they tend to be dominant. So I think these are, these are factors that makes the term dysbiosis to be so challenging. Um, so the, the follow-up is, you know, I, I think if I, if I can break down some of the takeaways that I, from, from your, the presentation, um, the, the, the real challenge is that a lot of the data is cross-sectional, it's difficult to establish directionality. 
So in, in my mind, the way I break it down is that the lab microbiome may be playing a role on either pathogen susceptibility, autoimmunity is something that I think it's an interesting aspect that has barely been studied, but that might be very important for this transplant cohort, and inflammatory injury. On the other side, the microbiome might be a bystander, an end product of whatever changing in the immune environment is. I think you propose some uh, ideas on how to study this moving forward. I, I, you know, I kind of pick up the, the longitudinal, uh, uh, the need for longitudinal studies, uh, but also the clinical, the need for clinical trials. You know, that there's a lot of interventions that these patients are faced with. Um, a protocolized way and randomization of some of these medications, if possible. I know that is challenging, but it would be very important to look at how those could affect the microbiome. No, I don't know if you have extra thoughts on that. Oh, I completely agree. I think that it's time to move from associations to, to looking for actual like causation and follow up with clinical trials. The only ones, you know, so far that I've really seen published are in vitro studies and mouse models. And people have not, you know, although we've got plenty of a population, people people are not yet studying this in humans, yeah. except for uh, retrospectively or, or maybe even prospectively, but not interventional. Yeah, mouse studies are great, we love it. But, but the problem is, you know, how to establish a good model that resembles what happens in humans. And bear in mind that the microbiome that is, might be normal, to a human, it's not normal for a mouse. So, so those are big challenges. No? I, I also found provocative your suggestion that uh, monitoring an elovirus, an elovirus could be used as a, to titrate immunosuppression. Um, I, I, you know, it's, I, I, I'm not, I, I, I'm not that convinced that we're, that, that we have good data yet on that and that's where maybe the clinic like, and there's a need for a clinical trial the challenge I, I guess would be how do you how, how would you approach the data because you know, the day the sequencing data that we do is semi-quantitative is sparse is compositional is is this you know is this going to be an effective way of doing it or should we try is there a need for more quantitative targeted approaches? For example, for an elovirus in the setting of a clinical trial and see if, if that's, I mean, that, that would be very nice if, if you can monitor. Yeah, and I think, I think so as well. And, and, you know, it's not like we necessarily need a new way to titrate immunosuppressants. I mean, we've been getting along fine for decades titrating them without anelloviruses. But if, if, our, if we could perform studies that indicated with greater sensitivity that, um, that we can predict this either earlier or uh, with greater sensitivity, uh, anticipating rejection episodes, then yeah, it would be potentially useful. Obviously, you know, drawing a TACRO level or monitoring other things is less invasive than doing a BAL to get an elloviruses level. But I, I, I propose that it could be an additional study if, if ideally, if you were going to do a bronchoscopy, you have this fluid, if you could do a variety of different tests on it, you know, one procedure to get all of this information could be potentially um, useful in the future for surveillance. That's great. Any other comments, Gauri? Yeah, I would just say I <clears throat> do think the challenge is we have many centers performing lung transplants that have rich specimens, you know, that are banked. And how do we as a community work together to do these studies where there's such a wide variety of, you know, how we manage these patients at in the individual center? You know, do we do more longitudinal collections at our own centers, maybe standardize a little bit of, of how the sequencing is done within, um, kind of generate our center data and then have comparisons that way. You know, I think that that's, that's been, I think when we're writing this review, such, such a big challenge with this type of research. And I don't know what your thoughts would be um, about how, how do we move to that step? Yeah, no, I, I, I think the 
there are some key points. I think it's a, it's a great opportunity, this cohort, you know, and many, and many places have access to it. There, is, there are some special considerations that I think people have to take when conducting microbiome studies. The low biomass, the sequencing approach, these are all real challenges. And, you know, having published on this and being a reviewer on this, I can tell you that there's, it's a challenge if you don't have good controls, good controls for DNA contamination, so you, uh, and, and good, good approach uh, for, for your sequencing and sequencing analysis. So I don't think that there is a single standard, but there are a few tips that, that people have to do. Right now, publishing a paper without having background contamination uh, assays, is, is an, you're not going to get to any, any it's going to be very hard to publish. So, so there are some things that, you, that people should try to uh, uh, consult when, when conducting this. Uh, but th there is a great opportunity in this cohort. So I don't think that there's any other cohort in which you have access to longitudinal or early samples. That's, that's amazing. Uh, I think, th and there's a, a tremendous clinical need, as you pointed out, this is a, a, a one of the transplants that there's plenty of room to make improvement. Um, so, so I think that's a major challenge. The other thing is the, the confounders, you know, the, the treatment confounders, the, the protocolized way of treating the patients. These are a complex cohort. They frequently receive antibiotics. They are always receiving immunosuppression. So having a good plan on how to control for this, uh, it, it's gonna be very, very important. Um, I, I don't think that we have, uh, there is some data in kidney and lung transplant that increased TTV levels in blood correlate with stable lower levels associated with increased risk of rejection. Again, this, this again uh, is related to whether this type of medications will eventually be impacting the microbiome and if the, if the microbiome is in the causal paths or not. I don't think that we're ready to associate, to, to, to make any comments on that, but I don't know, Caroline, if you want to. Yes, yeah, so um, Anella viruses and Tenotorque viruses specifically, um, I did think it was interesting that when they were, uh, all the papers that were describing the viral microbiome, um, they weren't just talking about BAL, um, and L virus levels that they were including serum uh, tinotorque virus levels, and they don't seem to, they don't correlate the same way. You might have high levels in BAL and low levels in blood. So I think one of my slides did demonstrate that um, lower, or was it increased? Uh, I'm gonna have to look back. Here's Various lower different level. levels in blood, uh, lower levels in blood was more associated with um, acute cellular rejection. So that that would be something that you could uh, obtain without having to do a BAL. You could do a simple blood test. Um, I didn't know about the kidney data, but uh, I did see that in lung in lung transplant patients, they're measuring anella viruses and tenotorque viruses in blood and BAL, and they seem to have different different implications in, in both places. Okay. All right. Thank you. This was an interesting discussion. I hope uh, the audience enjoyed it. And Thank you, everybody, so much. I'm going to turn it back to Brian. Well, thank you. AST would like to thank our panelists and attendees for today's session. Please remember to complete the evaluation survey and visit myast.org slash journal club to view our video archives and register for upcoming journal clubs. To learn more about AST's infectious disease and thoracic and critical care communities of practice, please visit myast.org slash COPS or connect directly to the IDCOP and TCC COP hubs. Thank you all again for today's great session.